Hey, beautiful soul. Welcome to Spirit Speakeasy. I'm Joy Giovanni, joyful medium. I'm a working psychic medium, energy healer, and spiritual gifts mentor. This podcast is like a seat at the table in a secret club, but with mediums, mystics, and the spiritual luminaries of our time. So come behind the velvet ropes with me and see inside my world as I chat insider style with profoundly gifted souls. We go deep, share juicy stories, laugh a lot, and it wouldn't be a speakeasy without great insider secrets and tips. You might even learn that you have some gifts of your own. So step inside the spirit speakeasy. beautiful souls. Welcome back to another episode of Spirit Speakeasy. Today's conversation is not going to disappoint. Now, some of you may know this about me. Uh, I am a psychic medium. I know a lot of mediums and practitioners and readers of various kinds. I don't tend to receive a lot of readings. Uh, It's not because I don't love them, because I do, but Often I feel like I have my own guidance or I I don't necessarily need a reading. So I wait until I feel really moved or really called to book a reading with someone. And that happened recently where I just had a few questions kind of nagging on me. I did all my practices in the way that I do them. I felt like I had my answers, but I just wanted some deeper insight, some confirmation, some validation. And through an amazing uh, friend, client, colleague, I was introduced to this incredible soul named Monica. She goes um, on many platforms by Guru Grit. That's where her Patreon is listed under, and that is what her TikTok is listed under. She's quite a TikTok sensation. So if you go to TikTok and search at Guru Grit, you will see that she has tens of thousands of followers at this point. And I received the most amazing reading from her. I listened to it. It's an audio reading. I listened to it in my living room and set some time aside to listen to it. It was like an, like over an hour reading. And I laughed through the whole thing because she was so spot on with the depth and specific details of information that she was sharing with me about myself. Um, some things that were grander scale, like life purpose and potential type of partner that I might be looking for. And some things that were um, maybe more like if we're going to measure maybe smaller on the scale, like being injury prone and uh, a certain type of dog that (laughs) I've been talking to some friends about very recently uh, that just so happens to be a good type of pet for me. And, and so many things in between. So I reached out, I immediately followed her on all the platforms, joined her Patreon, and then reached out. And I was like, I wonder if Monica will come on Spirit Speakeasy and let me talk to her and just share some of her wisdom and information about not only the way astrology works, but what are the differences between something like things that are fated for us or destined for us versus free will. How does that work? What's the difference between Western astrology and Vedic astrology and really what type of things can we actually know through astrology like the depth and specificity so she shares all of this and so much more Um, you hear me say it through the episode a few times but I could chat with her for like a thousand hours she is just such an incredible resource and beautiful soul so without further ado I'm going to share with you my conversation with Monica Guru Grit. Hey, beautiful souls. Welcome into this week's episode of Spirit Speakeasy. I, as you heard in the intro, am so excited to get to chat with our guest this week. Her name is Monica. The name of her company or the work that she does is Guru Grit, and I'm going to tell you all about Monica. She's a passionate astrologer and longtime student of the occult. She runs Guru Grit, a place for learning, which aims to inspire and educate rather than propagate fear-based attitudes within spirituality. You can see why I like her already. Energetic and curious, she reads as well as writes and teaches on many subject matters within the esoteric realm. And when she's not teaching or reading for her amazing 
clients. Monica busies herself spreading knowledge from her vintage book collection, running, cooking, traveling, and avoiding scratches from her greatest spiritual teacher, a mean cat named Mila. I will link in the show notes where you can find her. She's at Guru Grit across most social media, um, especially her like really wonderful TikTok following of like <laughs> such an amazing following she has. So you can find her there, but check out the show notes. Welcome, Monica. It's so great to have you. Thank you, Joy. Thank you for having me more importantly. Well, I mean, and I, I was just so grateful that I was able to get you. I know you've got such a lot going on and you're so busy. As I will have mentioned in the intro, I met you through a mutual client and friend and I actually received a reading from you. I don't get a lot of readings, um, probably just like you. I think we get pretty good at reading for ourselves and also know a lot of other readers. But one of the most amazing things about your work is the way you're blending so many different, I don't know, spiritual techniques, so many styles of reading. So I'd love for you to share more about what you do and how you came into this work. Sure. I came into this work, I think like most young people, uh, when they discover what horoscopes are, I was only 12. You oh, think it's cool or you look at the little symbols. Only thing is I never outgrew it. So <laughs> it stayed with me forever. I just took it deeper and deeper. And um, when I was 13, my sister for my birthday got me my first little, like, little birthday book on astrology and a book on dreams and signs. And that same year, by total fluke, a friend of mine was coming to visit me. She lives outside the city and she took the bus down and there was a little store in this bus shelter that sold little occult things. And we didn't know anything, you know, um, it was like the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> she got me my first ever tarot deck. I didn't know anything. And that was kind of it was just, I was put on that path. And wow. for someone with a really short attention span, it's the only thing I've never really gotten sick of along with like food and <laughs> my love of animals. And so uh, like most people, you know, I grew up in Toronto. So in the West, most people, the first thing you're going to learn about is Western astrology. Right. And I feel that here, the culture is greatly uh, one of consuming entertainment. It's It's very popular. I'm not judging it. But you know, it's mostly used as a tool for entertainment like wouldn't that be fun if it was true or if da 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 but a lot of people don't give much credence to it or a lot of weight you know and yeah. it's an um as and when kind of thing that you use and well, I, I think like you mentioned a lot of people think of it just like the ones that we well we might be near the same age but the ones that you used to get like in the magazines or in the newspaper like mm -hmm. more for entertainment that's what you're talking about right yes yeah and they'll say um you know, oh, like Taurus and Capricorn, are you going to be steamy in the sheets or something? Yeah. It's like, really? <laughs> you know, that's, that's all it takes. Very sensationalized. Yeah. Very sensationalized. You know, um, it's like, it just, it has to hit all the pleasure centers of your brain for you to pay attention to it. And that's sort of interesting because that's the first cue that you shouldn't take something seriously because it's yeah. just an instant hit. But I mean, I'm not like, again, people have done great work, especially through, I think the seventies astrologer, Linda Goodman, she single-handedly kind of caused this like revival and I have her books like love signs and star signs. I have got her like old vintage books. And I think this That's woman, so cool. you know, it is cool. And I think like what's cool is for her too, she didn't really live a spiritual life particularly. And then she dove into this and brought it back. And I think we're going through a huge renaissance of the occult in, in the best possible way. We're kind yeah. of in a spiritual dark age. And I think a tool is useless if you don't use it. And we can use this for something really wonderful. So through my 20s, it was mostly Western astrology. Of course, I heard about other systems, but you're like, I've only got so much time in the day to like work and stay alive. I don't it's have time a lot to of information. Else. It's a it's lot of so information. much information, <laughs> you know, and I, I'm foolish in that in my, in my youthfulness, I thought in a way I was lucky because I was naive. I thought I'll give it a year. Cause I started hearing about something called nakshatras, lunar mansions. I said, I know like Vedic is a little bit different. I said, I'll just give it a year. If I don't like care for it, I'll get, and it, anyways, it's been eight years and I'm still oh doing Vedic astrology. <laughs> Because once you start learning, you can't stop. I always liken it to like the fraying of a sweater. You pull the thread and that's it. You just, yeah. you, why would you stop? Realistically, when you've met a collector of something, if you're a collector yourself, once you start collecting something, you cannot find a good reason to stop. Even if it's animals, you can't stop, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, um, and then it dawned on me that there's still a lot of bias and, um, you know, human filtration. People will say, 
this is the right way. This is the wrong way. You know, you have to be afraid. They're right. We're wrong. And I thought, why would anyone in their right mind disregard anything they've ever learned? That makes absolutely yeah. no sense. And, and the people that we take our cues from who've done great things wouldn't think so black and white. And it's about resonance. It's about energy. So I had some serious discourse with myself when I moved towards Vedic astrology. And I thought, okay. Okay, you know, am I going to disregard everything I've spent over 10 years loving so much? Yeah. No, it's taught me something valuable. And before any of this, you know, that I did like for my friends or for money, I love history. So I did what I knew how to do, which is to look it up. And there was a time, you know, not I suppose too long ago in human history, all things considered, Eastern and Western astrologers would gather and they would sit and wow. share information and break bread and they weren't so different you know they really weren't so yeah. different so the differences would come down to I mean the reason for the differences I don't really care there are some technical differences yeah. but I think some people they have some really good theories uh, one of them was caused by a Greek mistranslation you know oh, so it's like yeah so I think you know what though the only way to really be sure is if if you know that it works and I think that comes down to the instrument that comes down to the human vessel right. so you know if you go to western astrologer and they're really in alignment and they're very much in tune they don't need divisional charts they don't need nakshatras they can just they have some ability they can just tell you it's like yeah. something speaking to them and the same goes for vedic astrologers there's just a resonance in that individual they, they it transcends what you can learn from a book or from a teacher you know they can just well, feel it i mean as as a psychic medium my two cents about it would be that there is a level of blending of the energy of souls and you're not just you know just like it's if <laughs> i'm amazed we'll get into this in a second but i'm amazed at the depth of information that can come from someone's birth chart it's like a whole guide map about you know so many things but i feel like it's like sometimes if we're if we're expecting it to be one thing or judging it as one thing it's like you might like you were saying you might lose the power of information that another system's bringing. And I believe that we're all doing some form of empathic, intuitive work at all times. So if you're steeped so much in this teaching and this learning and, and probably doing your own spiritual practice as well, yeah, like a degree, a percentage of this is going to be what you're intuiting as the practitioner, as the reader when you're, you know, because two people might have some of the same information, but you're looking at it in comparison to all the other information, plus what you're just receiving intuitively, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I would think. Mm -hmm. You definitely blend a piece of your essence. This yeah. is, this is very important that you bring this up. There's a reason if you go through my work, uh, public, you know, posted work, why you don't see a lot of, uh, I would call frivolous, and I don't say that lightly or to shade anybody, we're all on our own path, but celebrity examples, like I don't care oh, yeah. who so-and-so broke up with or is marrying, to, to do that, to sensationalize something every other day of the week to, to get, you know, a lot of views. Yeah. is a misuse of something quite sacred. And you have to understand to the person who's casting those charts, you give a bit of yourself every time you do it, you know? Yeah, so, I mean, that makes sense. That's a good point. Yes, because there is an exchange of, we can call it karmas or an energetic transference. You know, people talk about love at first sight and eyes are windows to the soul. So there yeah. is an energetic transference when you look at someone, they give you the creeps or something. But when you look at a chart, you look at their blueprint of their soul. Actually, it's so funny you mentioned that. Just yesterday, the day before, someone, we were talk I was talking to someone about this and I said, I can only count it on one hand. Like, I'm not an angry person. I have a, pr I have a pretty good composure, you know. If anything, if I'm angry, I'm an ice queen, you know. And I thought, I remember reading two charts, one in the spring and one just last week. And I swear it like threw me into a fit of rage. Like I went for a oh, walk and I couldn't relax. And it was just a few nights ago. Um, I live in a like, very residential area and a car didn't stop at the stop sign. It like rolled and I was crossing the road and I like waved at it like, hello. And I'm not yeah. small, like I'm five nine. I was like, hello, like don't kill me. And it didn't, it sped up. And then I, I, oh my gosh. I, yeah, I tried it. And then he like sped through the stop sign. And I thought I've definitely had something latch onto me, you know, and I know Eckhart Tolle has talked about that happening to him as well in his earlier work. And I thought there's a serious energetic transference. Okay. 
And you don't know these people. You don't know who's coming to you. They might know a bit about you, but you don't know about them. And so when you're constantly reading the charts of celebrities for fun, for enjoyment, or even opening your own chart every morning to say, okay, Mercury's doing this and it's trining that. And am I going to get on the bus or am I going to walk? You're actually weakening your own willpower. Okay. The point of a tool is to be useful. Like if you use a knife for mundane things, it will dull the blade. You need to use it you know, for very, chopping an onion, <laughs> very specific, yeah. intentionally. So well, that's um, a great point. Cause I think that covers not just what you do with astrology, but any modality of reading, even like, um, you know, some people like to pull a card every day for themselves. Even something like that can, if it gets to be where it's stressful or where we're like nervous and trying to chart our, <laughs> you know, path to work because of it, or yeah, that's not <laughs> maybe not the best way to use this tool. So that's a great point. Yes. So it makes you, makes you like decadent, makes you soft and not in a good way, not in a relaxed way, in a way where you're so dependent on your external circumstances that you're never, no matter what happens, you could win the lottery and you wouldn't be fulfilled. You would think about how to win your power away, right? Giving your power away. Talking about like forgetting how we're a conscious co-creator. Yes. These placements or you know if it's astrology we're looking at the planetary placements they are what they are but we still have free will for how we move you know it's not just things outside happening to us or never um, yeah it's it's the way we're moving intentionally through the world right yes very much and and aware of it so that's why any modality you use you're the user of that thing Okay, so one of the things that I really enjoyed um, learning deeply through the Vedic system was the nature of planets. And I always, when I teach, I think think of the planets as people is very helpful. And um, oh, interesting. It is because it gives you, you know, like ancient Greeks were really good at that and the Romans yeah. too. Like they, the, the deities they gave human personalities to, they were jealous and they were covetous or lustful or something, but you can do that in a good way as well. So let's yeah. say like, you know, Venus, we know as a love and beauty and arts. Okay. But Mercury is the artist. He's okay. the actor. Mercury rules expressive people. And so if, you know, you're looking for, if someone has a creative capacity in their chart, of course they need a strong Venus, but depends what they're doing. Are they an art dealer? Are they a a shopper? Do they have a shopping addiction? Do they just appreciate refined things? So when you look at Mercury, I always thought, and it's Mercury Day, so I'm bringing him up in homage. (laughs) Um, um, the The creator is greater than the thing being created. So if you think of yourself as a creator, you have more power than a deck of cards. You have more power yeah. than some software that generates compatibility or something, you know? So you have to keep that in mind anytime you get any sort of work done. I think that's such so important. Even just, you know, as you're talking about the, the ancient Greeks and the way they personified these planets and things, you know, it's not dissimilar to a sculptor having a tool. It's not the chisel that's creating the statue. It's the sculptor and the way that they are wielding the tool just like this. Um, exactly. Like some questions for you. So will you quickly touch on for anyone that doesn't know, um, you've mentioned Vedic astrology a couple of times. I know just a little bit about it. I know that it's based in the East Indian system, right? Yes. So it originates from the Eastern part of the world, as you mentioned, and it's just, it's very well preserved compared to the West. So clearly as astrology, I think Alexander the Great actually, uh, salvaged the majority of astrology and and brought it over and um whatever remained intact is what we have today at a, at one point in time they weren't super super different i would say okay. i mean like if you go back a long time ago but um the vedic system obviously if you were to take it very seriously it would be like a lifestyle okay so Whatever the question, they have an answer. <laughs> That's basically okay. how it goes. What you should eat, you know, um, like for example, this month I'm not supposed to be harsh with my speech, okay? And there could be some uh, temper flare-ups, you know. As you can tell, I'm not shy, so I have to kind of watch my tongue. They can tell you that ahead of time. There's okay, so there's twelve signs, twelve houses. They, unless it's Neo Vedic astrology, they don't tend to factor in outer planets, Pluto, Uranus, and Neptune. Personally, I have not found them to be very effective in natal charts, unless they're very close. Like if you have Uranus very close to the moon or Pluto close to your moon, you know, I could say, oh, you might have some mental health instability, you know, but generally I like to use them for mundane charts because they are, they're very slow moving. And so they will affect generations more so, I think, than individual things, but to each their own. 
And so they tend to use the original seven planets, Sun through Saturn, plus the nodes. The nodes have a very deep meaning in the Vedic tradition in Jyotish. In the in the West, they're more like we understand them to be karmic and and powerful, but it's just and and they're, but they're malefic. You know, when we talk about the North Node, it's like it's what your soul wants. Want and needing to experience are different things. If something yeah, is faded, you know, <laughs> if you have if you have fixed karma to experience pain and you come to me, I can tell you, brace yourself. Nothing in the world, nothing in existence, including, you know, the Almighty, because the Almighty wants your soul to expand, is saying you're gonna go through this breakup or you're gonna go through whatever, you know? It's how you face it. But you must right. face it. You know, so you can kind of it's just a little bit more realistic, I think in that regard. And in any case, so that's what they use. And then they have something called lunar mansions. Nakshatras actually predate astrology. And there's 27 of them. Some people use 28. <laughs> and they give a deeper insight. So let's say like each zodiacal sign will house about, you know, two and a half, three, so three of the nakshatras, because they're divided, you divide it down. If you take like 12 divided by 2.5, it's based on moon. So the movement of the moon, the moon spends about two and a half days in every single sign. Okay. So that adds another layer of information. And then on top of that, there's something called Varga charts, which are divisional charts. So let's say like you take the seventh house of partnership, marriage, the corresponding chart to that is called the Navamsha chart. It's the D9. It's pretty much the most popular chart after your Rashi chart or your D1 chart, your birth chart. So your birth chart is like the king. And then you can open a chart for everything. There's a chart for children, a chart for dating and co-creating with others, a chart for wealth and home, a chart for career, end of life, illness, studies, uh, lineage, past lives, like everything. So um, a lot of that has been lost in the Western tradition. Okay. And so you did mention something about people using intuition. And this is where I find, uh, you know, East meets West is so interesting, where yeah. in the West, it's so funny to me how most things in the West, culturally, we feel the need to intellectualize everything and anything in order to give it some kind of weight or importance. You know, it's like, oh, but, you know, like, I don't know, there's just always this need to like be able to measure and quantify things like very scientific, right. except when it comes to astrology and divination. It's very much like you go online now, it's so oversaturated. You know, I'm glad these things are making a comeback, but just because you're in the age of information doesn't mean that all the information is good or that it's correct. You have to be very discerning. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll say something like intuitive, um, whatever, astrologer, okay? And I'm, I'm wondering, what does that mean? Because I don't know what your intuition means for you. I know what my intuition means for me. But mm -hmm. I know if you say you're an astrologer, and it's not a regulated profession, so I can only hope to God You've done the work. You've put yeah. in 10 years, you know, of hours. You've read the books. You've taken the seminars. You've spent serious tuition, you know, time and money or something to, to learn. I don't know what that means. So you cannot substitute technical skill with feeling alone unless you're somehow masterful and you have such abilities that you don't even need astrology, okay? In that case, then don't call yourself yeah. an astrologer. And then when we look to the East, which, you know, spiritual life is so well preserved um, and harnessed regularly. We tend to get a lot of sort of inversion where this this one thing is super spiritual, but over here it's super technical. So to be taken seriously, to be taken to be a good astrologer, you really have to know your stuff. It's very unforgiving. Yeah. And you should. You should honor it. You should respect it. You should do the work. You should sacrifice and all of that. Um, but I think like intuition or certain abilities play a smaller role or a lesser role. And I think if you can meet in the middle and use both, that is sort of the best. So yeah. Another thing, too, that will really go with that, when I said, you know, this this is a lifestyle for people who do it, they really do it. This is what I mean. They will, you know, um, I was talking about the planets as gods, planets as people. Well, you know, Saturn is Lord Shani. It is a deity. And then there's corresponding deities to every single day, you know. So, like, one of my favorite days is Tuesday because the deities I really like, uh, it's their day. So, like, Ganesh, Lord Ganesh guards all the sacred science he's the guardian in general he guards all the sacred yeah. science sacred knowledge so every astrologer before reading you know they they know you pray to ganesh or you give something to ganesh you acknowledge you honor it is because of him that you're able to receive this information and so it's really interesting how they blend this incredible technical knowledge and prowess and you know 
it's a science. It really is. It's not, it's not frivolous. As yes. I was saying, it's very no, serious. And thank you for clarifying that. Cause I <laughs> no way meant, I actually, it's, it's one of my pet peeves too. When people just take a weekend course or get some online, you know, I like people to be steeped in the knowledge that they have, the practices, you know, whatever it is that they practice. Um, but I do like the idea of intuition getting used more, but like you said, alongside that training, that experience, that wisdom. So thank you for clarifying that. Cause I think that's a really mm. important point. Well, it's intuition hardcore, you doesn't know? cover all, right? <laughs> it, to, I think it helps to have someone show you. You can go to a really good astrologer and you could have, this happened to me twice. The person who came to me, the people, I should say, both of them had no desire to learn astrology. And I said, you have incredible talent. Like you're just naturally attuned to this work. Consider it, you know, and three, four years later, they've went on to learn a lot. And in some, in some of the areas, they far surpassed me, but someone showed them like someone showed me, you know, um, it helps and it helps to, you go to a good astrology, they'll say, you know, I think people come to me a lot for money and they'll say, I need a money remedy. And they're, maybe they're thinking they'll burn a bay leaf or, you know, invest. I'll tell them something practical, like invest yeah. in stocks. Da, da, da. And I see that the way that they eat is hindering their ability to save money. So you, you tell them, oh, don't eat this or try eating that or clean your liver or something. It's all connected. You know, some people have issues with love and I'm telling them, you need to go take a trip. It will, or, or make peace with your, with your mother or something, you know, it'll unblock it. But in any case, um, the, the interesting thing, it is really is a lifestyle. It corresponds to spirituality, having a sadhana, having a discipline, ritual practice, because where do these abilities come from? Like, yes, they do come from you, but if you want to sharpen them, if you want to be better, um, you basically work with the planets, you work with the gods, you work with the deities, you do something for one another. When you do the mantras, when you do the prayer, when you do the offering, you're feeding them. And then when it comes time for you to read and be a better reader, they feed into you, which helps you serve people. It's not about you, right? Yeah. It, all, you do all of that to just give a better experience. I think it's really like, magical and beautiful, but that's what I really liked I about it. it. Yeah. And even as you're saying it, I'm thinking about, I mean, I, I tend to relate everything to myself just because how my little brain works over here, but I'm thinking even with mediumship, I do a version of a meditation that is just my devotion and relationship building and time spending where I am offering my time just to sit with the spirit world and create relationships so that when it is time to work, they already have, we have been spending time together. They do know how to work with me. It is it's not dissimilar to what you're saying, where it's like putting in that time and devotion and dedication or, or whatever it is for that practice to, yeah, it's not just something that you flip a switch and it's not part of your life and the way you move and breathe in the world at some, at some point when you're <laughs> practicing mm -hmm. to that level. So I love, I love that. Yeah. It's like flexing a spiritual muscle. So the first thing is it's not transactional. It's yeah. not like if I do this for you, do that for me. That's why I say it's a lifestyle. Cause if I take a vacation for one month and I don't touch a chart, that doesn't mean that I get to stop. Yeah. <laughs> it's right. a part of you. It's a part of who you are. You form relationships with something bigger than yourself. And I mean that um, not in a hierarchical sense, like humans are teeny and meaningless. No, you know, it's like, okay, my father's religious. When he goes and travels on vacation, he doesn't forget God. He still prays. He still does what he does because he's a godly person, you know? Yeah. So it's like, if you're a medium, even if you don't have a client for a day, you don't forget that you're mostly yeah. spirit. You don't forget all that's around you. So that's what I really liked about uh, Joe Tishis is really integrative. And I felt like I didn't have to choose between being a very, you know, cerebral person who could do, you know, look at combinations, look at yogas in the chart or being a feeling person who's intuitive. I could actually do both. And when I committed myself, you know, I think just what I could do exploded, like it opened up all sorts of possibilities. So, yeah, so that's, that's, that's the difference. Um, I think in a very technical sense from our perspective, but to a person coming to you, what would be the difference would be that, you know, in the West, they use the tropical system. So, you know, if you're a Capricorn in the West, you're probably a Sagittarius in the, in the East, because okay. there's a um, 23 to 24 degree difference in, in how the signs are going to apply. And then probably the way that they, the astrologer is going to cast the chart and 
you know, extract information from it is going to sound or look different. But I mean, so many things, I think in life, when you're meant to receive an answer, you'll receive the answer. So it doesn't really yeah, matter who you I go agree. to. If the person knows their <laughs> stuff, you're going to get the same answers there. And, and it is so, I have always been so drawn to astrology and I, as you know, I've got my little Gemini moon over here. So I like to have my fingers in lots of pots and just for my my personal education and expansion, I love to learn bits about lots of things. Astrology is one thing that's always felt so, I don't know. It's almost like as I, as I start to tiptoe into the water, I realize like, oh my gosh, this is a big ocean to swim. And I kind of just wade in the shallow for me. But will you share just kind of some different examples of like what people can know through astrology? Because I think it's back to what you were saying that for so many years, especially in the West, it's been, I don't know, presented more as like entertainment or like more fluffy. And the depth and specificity of information mm. that you can know about someone in their chart blows my mind to the point that I don't even know how to articulate it. Um, would you share some on that or give some examples of like sure. what we, what you can know? You can know anything, actually, know, anything. So uh, you did say, yes, it's mostly for fluff and entertainment. And I've, I've always been very suspicious, even as a child, why that was. Because there's very famous people who use astrologers. You know, I think Ronald Reagan very famously had an astrologer who told him when to board a flight, what, you know, when not to go to an event, when to, to avoid any kind of like attempt on his life or anything, you know. Um, I know. I, I believe um, one of the British prime ministers, I won't say I'm a little bit scared. <laughs> They're still alive. Um, his wife is really into the occult. And I think, you know, um, it's something that can't really be explained. It has to be experienced. And yeah, this is something I find point. is difficult to do with uh, some men. They feel like, well, if they can't make sense of it through a scientific lens that they think is the only way to understand something, then it can't ring true. But I'm telling you, it's like, you can't measure it like that. You know, it's like, right. it doesn't make sense. So that's the first thing. But you can know, you know, the basic things. Like I mentioned fixed karmas, you know, so what kind of family are you born into? Why is it difficult? Is it not? It, and um, I think it gives people a lot of peace and closure to know that everyone suffers in equal proportion, but in different ways. <laughs> there's nothing personal, you know? Yeah. Um, and then there's things that you can kind of change with some effort. And then there's things that you can change with very little effort or conscious effort. So it could be anything, capacity to earn money, what kind of work you should do. Uh, I, I specialize in relationships. That was something that was taught to me. I didn't think I would ever do that, but my teachers opened my eyes. And so, um, you know, can you have inform loving relationships? You know, what are the chances of that? Obviously, predictive things are pretty hot. Everybody loves to know when things will get better for them. And anything, diet, what kind of food you should eat. And then something that I really find interesting, I did mention, uh, you know, people coming to me who didn't realize they were naturally natural born astrologers is yeah. spiritual ability. You can yeah, see, you cool know, one. yeah, is someone open minded? Are they open to the world? Will they travel a lot? Um, their body type, their health, the kind of children they'll have, truly anything. It's like looking into their soul. That's why I yeah. say never to do it. I'm not saying it to fear monger, but don't do it frivolously because the payoff is, is so minuscule. Why would you waste yeah. your energy on that? Well, I think when I say like, I, when I grew up, it was more like, oh, we don't really believe in this or frivolous. I think it's because my misconception was that it was just the general you know, 12 sign in the newspaper, like that's it. But the depth of, of what it is when it's a personalized reading or a personalized chart is like, um, the way I understand it, you tell me if I'm right or wrong, I guess, is you, you cast the chart based on time of birth, exact location in the world and birth date. And then it's, it's a, essentially a map of the planetary alignments, the sky, everything as it was in the moment that someone was born. And then I always jokingly, half jokingly, see it as like, we all say like, oh, I wish we came with a guide map or like, I wish we came with an instruction manual. I'm like, that's your astrology chart. Yes. Like, that is the instruction manual for only you for your, this lifetime. Exactly. That's how you see it. Exactly. And people say, what if um, somebody's born the same day as you? or the same hour as you. Well, one of the really wonderful things about how intact and well-preserved Vedic astrology is, is in the divisional charts, 
they change. Okay, so the ascendant will change every two and a half hours with the main birth chart. But some of the, let's say the D7 of, let's say it's the chart of the kind of people you're going to date before you're married. Okay, let's put it like that. Okay, co-create with others. That will also change around two hours. When you get to the marriage chart, the D9, that shifts every 10 minutes. Wow. Okay, so even if you're born within a 40 minute window, or this is a, an important fact to mention if you're getting a reading, if you're a multiple birth, if you're a twin, a triplet. I was just thinking birth. that. So funny. Very important. <laughs> so if you're a natural, you know, twin birth and the turnaround time was 18 minutes or something like that, well, that's very different. That's already going to look different for your married life, yeah. you know, or your dharma or your second half of life. And then when you get down to the D60, which is really important, that can shift 60 seconds. So even if you're wow. C-section birth with a pair of twins, you're not always going to be born one minute apart. Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. So there is always, and, and there's slight differences as well. Even if they were born to the same minute, consider your environment. You know, like uh, two people growing up uh, in some suburb houses next to each other, they're going to have different parents. Or right. they're going to feel differently about their parents. So even like I, I, you can see, like I talk about Saturn moon conjunction in a chart, people like that tend to be a little bit old before their time. You know, they're not grow, they're not raised in the most nurturing environment, but even if they have like a loving home, like very Brady Bunch, you know, um, very happy or something like what's a Von Trapp family. Okay. I mean, okay. <laughs> their story is a little bit much, but they were loving. Okay. Yeah. If you had this conjunction, even if you're one of four, and it was a happy childhood. On some energetic frequency or vibration, you just knew you didn't really fit in or you were like the different one. You know, you were like quiet or you were, you know, they just, your parents knew you were like Benjamin Button. You were like born yeah. old and then you turned young. So no matter what, you know, there's this energetic thing that we find hard to put into words as human beings. And we're always looking for a mental reason or, or a way to reason, but reasoning too much actually causes insanity. So just, you just have to accept that some things cannot be explained, that they can be experienced. So right. astrology can show you everything and what you choose to do with that. That's up to you. I can't tell you how to do it. I can tell you, you know, do this mantra face West uh, 108 times a day for 40 days. Even if you get what you want, don't stop. If you, if you come back and you don't get what you want, I say, well, did you do it? And you're like, yeah, for five days. Well, I can't breathe for you. I can't chant for you. So, yeah, exactly. you know, even if you have siblings <laughs> or twins, you're each, you have your own will. God gave you your own will. So that's what you do. Well, yeah, totally true. And each person is an individual soul, even if, like you said, they were a, a minute apart in, mm. in birth. And it's why I think so many of us, I don't have siblings that I grew up with, but so many people that do will, will say, oh yeah, even though we grew up together, we're, we're very different people. I, I, we haven't even chatted about, um, the reading that you did <laughs> just for me. I've chatted with several other people about it, but not you. Uh, it, to me, some of the there are so many things in there that like I've listened to it already a few times. I've put it through a program to give me like the transcript of it so I can read it and I've made notes about it. But even something as small as anyone listening that knows me uh, will know, I it's been kind of a running joke my whole life that I'm dangerous with like sharp objects and knives. Like I will hurt myself. And I, I was like, you're laughing now. I was laughing out loud in my living room. I'm looking at my living room the whole time because I was like, this girl knows me like this is crazy. These things, because it's something about my Mars. You were like, you need to be careful with um, blades or sharp objects. And I was like, oh my God, I do need to be careful with sharp objects. Like it's even the way I'll hold something to try to open a box is like always the wrong way. Like even though in my mind, I know. So it's just kind of funny and validating to see the big and small things that can be understood, known, identified through the reading. So it's yes. not only is I, it very informative, but there's some funny little nuance. It's always funny because you know. life is funny, you know, and that's why I always, yeah. I pay attention to the, I just opened your chart, sorry, while you were talking. And I was like, I, there was two more things I had to tell you. I told uh, our mutual friend, I was like, I don't want her to think I'm a stalker, <laughs> but I have to like update her. <laughs> Stop me, girl. <laughs> I will stalk you for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can see, uh, so I, I have uh, combinations for being accident prone and <laughs> there's just things you can't, you see what I mean? It's like um, experiencing injury. 
I can tell a client, you know, I, I jokingly, I'll say, don't run with scissors and don't hug a fire or don't try to high five a bear when you're hiking, like yeah. be sensible, you know? And that's the whole point. It's like, I know because I have it. And it's precisely because I have it. I have a good attitude about it because injury yeah. is unavoidable, but I'm not going to let it get me down. And because I don't let it get me down, it manifests less and less and less and less and less. It neg- it helps mitigate it somewhat. Yes. And that's what it means to like work with these things. So for example, when you work with deities, perhaps your, my injuries were unavoidable, but because I was open to, to being, like you said, devo- devoted, I'm a devoted individual because of my devotion, my spirits were so high that even when I was laid up in the hospital, I was like, Oh, okay. who cares? I'm alive, you know? And then yeah. I remember you know, my mother being a great spiritual teacher unintentionally. I think all mothers are, you know, I was going through a really rough period and she was like doing something. And I said, and then this happened and then that happened. And like, and then this didn't work out. And like, I've got nothing. Everything's gone wrong. You know, and I was like so sad. And she slowly turned around and went, you're alive, aren't you? And I was like, she's got me there. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> if we have uh, a good sense of humor, if we have perspective that this yeah. isn't personal, but it's unique. Right. It's unique well, to you. And then something else that you've been talking about I, <laughs> on your Patreon. So those of you that l- love Patreon and know that it's this amazing place where you can go and learn, uh, Monica has a Patreon under Guru Grit, which is mo- your call name for most Thing, so find her there. But you've been doing this series, and of course, it's been a series, so you're not going to be able to explain it in a few minutes, but about the difference in the things that are more like, quote unquote, predestined in the chart versus like what we have free will over. Will you, it's, since it's kind of like a natural transition, will you touch on that just a little sure. bit? It's been such an amazing series. I know you put a oh. new one out just yesterday. That I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I did to hear. That one, I just ran with it. Okay. So let's say there are Free will exists. Never forget yes. that. Free will is the dominant thing. It comes from God. Nothing is greater than God. It's, you can't question it, okay? I can look at someone's chart and say, you're going to get married, whatever, at 27. How they get married, where they get married, who they marry, if they want to marry them or not, that's up to them, you know? It's not to say that, like, it's unavoidable. It's, it's probably going to happen. It's highly probable. But how you do it, you have control over that. Right. And you know, that's a good example. But if I say to someone, you know, you're coming into a period of survival, like, you just have to survive. I don't know what's going on, you know, but, you know, get your affairs in order, drink water and uh, meditate, you're going to need it, you know. So it's up to you. Are you going to go through that experience joyfully? Are you going to extract what you need from it? Or are you going to victimize yourself? Are you going to feel low? And here's yeah. something people, I, I'm glad I used the marriage example. Something people don't like hearing is um, negative relationships. You know, with the, no, it's always the mom. I don't know what it is. You know, <laughs> People with mommy <laughs> issues love going to astrologers and other <laughs> readers, but it's like difficult mother, difficult father, um, horrible breakup. The truth of the matter is success is really easy. And after a short while, it's very boring. You know, people who've won the lottery, like the high wears off, like very fast, you know, negative relationships are far more useful to us. You know, food tastes better when you're really hungry, whether you want to admit it or not. And circumstances have the taste. You ever eaten like a crumpled up granola bar that's been in the bottom of your bag for two months, but you were starving? It's the best thing you've ever eaten. If you had a hearty breakfast and lunch... You can go to the best dinner, uh, you know, Michelin restaurant, whatever. It's not going to feel the same unless you're very like ravenous, right? Yeah. So you have to acknowledge those things in terms of limitations. So people love to be addicted to their limitations because it gives them an excuse not to try because they're afraid if they try, they'll fail or worse yet, they might be great. They might find out that they're great at something. And then that puts more responsibility on them. But you came here to evolve. So what tends to happen is you have some karmas you cannot change, okay? Your eye color, my eye color, my height, what your children that you had, that's done, right? Our parents, where we were born, that's done. What you do with that is up to you. Like you and I moved away from our birthplace. We had that choice. We took that. Maybe we made the decision. We took the decision to make it happen. Yeah. So some karmas cannot be changed. And that's not to say that that's to punish you. A lot of the times people think of it as they did something bad. It's there to punish them. You opted into that to experience growth. It's like the most fun thing ever. You get to exist. Yeah. <laughs> people are clamoring to be born here. <laughs> so For if sure. you, yeah. Yeah. You know, if you think of it like that, it's a great thing. And then some things are mid-range. Okay. Like, um, 
I, I have combinations for multiple relationships, but I'm never married. I don't, I don't want to accept every offer I get. That's within my control. And some people, yeah. it can show that they'll never get divorced. But if someone's been mean to you for the last 10 years and you'd rather be single than unhappy, they might take the decision to get that divorce, right? Yeah, um, exactly. Some people might have a chart. They're incredibly fertile and they choose not to have children. That's on them, you know, yeah. whatever it is. So there's, and, but there's tears. There's some things that are easily changed. I'll give you one, mine mid level one that I heard a lot from psychics, every, every reader ever, I think tea leaf, someone threw beans, you know, anything, astrologers, all of them. So many ways to read. Yeah. It's amazing. I love all the ways, you know, um, they said to me like, uh, you won't go back to school. It's really hard for you. It's very difficult. It will be uh, unfruitful. It'll be this, this, that, the other. And I didn't sort of do it in like a prideful sense. Like I'm going to go and I'm going to show you. I just like learning. I have a thirst for knowledge. Yeah. I'm like a bit of, you know, like I just like learning. I don't know. It's fun to me. Books are my friends. I didn't think too much of it. I didn't know how the money would come. I didn't know where I would go. Excuse me. But one way or another, I landed on the path and yes, it was hard and it was grueling and awful, but I still passed and I finished school. So yeah. I had to effort easily 10 times more than the people around me, but it's right. not impossible. And I'm not bitter about it. I still did it. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's the way to look at it, you know? So to me, that's one of the best parts of something like an astrology reading, like you did for me, because then it's giving you, I kind of take it more as like a heads up. Like if you were going to go, I don't know, drive a couple hours away and you check the report in the morning and say like, oh, heads up. Okay. There's going to, there's some traffic over here. This freeway's having some work done over here. There's a potential for rain. It's just going to let you know how you're going to prepare yourself or, you know, you might choose to take a longer path. You might make some choices and decisions based on the information that you discern. And some of it might be amazing. Oh, clear skies. You know, I can wear, I don't need a jacket, whatever it is. But it's just having the little bit of like heads up or extra understanding of the way things more potentially could go versus flying blind. But it doesn't mean that you're locked into Never. that path and those experiences, mm. right? Yes. I'll give the story of Neville Goddard, a great spiritual teacher. I know you've heard this, this on the Patreon already, but he was actually a practicing astrologer. He had students, he had clients. And when he received what he called the promise, which is he received the message that you create with your own mind, you create your reality. He never looked at another chart again. He just refused. And one of his former students was in a panic. You know, she advised a client, uh, the wind blew while she was looking at how to cast the chart. She went to go answer the door. It changed the book, the, the ephemeris. And she, she cast the chart 10 years off. Oh, but wow. she gave him some advice that he should invest money. And he said, if this works, I'll give you a cut. But she needed it. She was like a widow on a small pension. And he came over there because she was so distressed that she might have given bad advice and she really needed that money. And Neville said to her, did you believe the prediction when you gave it? She said, yes, wholeheartedly. He said, then close the book. I won't look at the chart. You just believe it and it's done. And it worked. So your own willpower will override anything because these things are more modalities. They're tools. They're useful yeah. tools, but tools can be misused. That's why I said frivolously, you know, looking at your chart every single day, looking at what can go wrong. And this is another thing too. Like if you're single and dating, I know that there's a huge revival in the culture now to ask guys their birth time, their sun sign, this, then that. I'm an astrologer and even I don't do that <laughs> because, you know, there's just no point. It, what's right yeah. for you. Is you'll feel it. You'll know it. You have to, you have to flex that inner muscle of knowing and trusting your intuition. And I think the more that you trust life, you're going to attract people that you can trust and you're going to attract forces that you can trust that will show you the way anyways. Yeah. So um, it's, it's about finding the balance, like what you and I do. We know how it works. We know what's possible, but it doesn't, you know, we're not completely consumed by it in a helpless sense. We just know, hey, if I, if I, I, I told you I impulse bought a plane ticket for a very long trip and I yeah. couldn't decide between two return dates and I cast the first chart. It looked good. But the second chart that had a debilitated moon, that one had an exalted moon conjunct Jupiter. I said, there's no question. This is the better date, you know, but I did that. I, did, I do that for myself maybe once, twice a year for yeah. when I take a big decision. I don't do it every week. I don't do it for little things. And I think that's where the power lies. And, um, when you were also talking about intuition, 
and helping people. You can only help someone to the degree that they're able to receive the answer. For sure. <laughs> There's no other way to put this. You know, I apologize in advance because some people, luckily it's never really happened to me, but um, if you ask a question, and this is why it's hard to, to prove this to skeptics because they're not interested in knowing the answer. Right. They're interested in being right. So they're not open, you know? So if you ask a question and you're like, well, let's just say uh, my friend got me uh, whatever, a guru grit reading, you know, or sometime with joy. I don't really care about this stuff. I guess, I guess I'll ask, will I get a promotion? Will I sell my house? Well, they, they don't give you anything to work with. It's like they yeah. want a cake, but they blow a sprinkling of, of cake flour. You, you can't work with this. You need like three cups of flour, you know? Yeah, exactly. You need that energy, that oomph, but it has to be like positive because if the yeah. person has a lot of desire towards a question about money or love, but they're anxious or they don't believe or they're stressed out, it like yeah. it pinches them off. You can't, you can stare at it, at them all day. You can't find the answer somehow. So you have to be open and relaxed. And, and the other person has to be able to receive what you're telling them. And it never ceases to amaze me. Like two, three years after I sent a reading, a person will email me like once, twice a month. I get emails saying, I've listened to this thing for like the 10th time. I finally got what you meant, that thing about my dog. And I'm just like, okay, cool. Like, I don't remember what I said, but yeah. you know, it's because you're always evolving and you're always expanding. Right. So I feel like if you get a Reiki healing done and you're resistant, it's not going to benefit you. Yeah. Just wait till you feel good and then go get the reading and then you'll get the full benefit of it. You know, it's, and we've all done this. We all bought something, yeah. brought it home, never took off the tag and never wore it. Yeah. It just yeah. sat there. That's well, to your point, I think if it's, it's the intention behind it, like you were saying with the checking every day and being nervous every day, is it that you're, someone's approaching this desire to have a reading from a place of fear or from a place of openness and expansion? You know, like what's the intention behind it? What's the feeling behind it? And I don't know about you from your perspective, from my perspective, I feel like that's a great starting point for people is to see like, how are you feeling? Are you feeling panicked and anxious and like you want some outside source to tell you the answers? Or are you feeling excited and open? And, you know, yeah. I don't know. I don't love the word curious in there because I think that kind of shifts the energy a little mm. bit in a funny way, but like excited about it and feeling positive or, or whatever it is, you know. Um, do you feel like that makes a big difference? Huge. Those base feelings of fear or, I don't feelings know, fear love for need. me is what it boils down to. Exactly. Curiosity. The best readings I give are people who <laughs> they just get the reading and they're like, I don't know you, but I saw you on this or my friend got one. Um, just tell me what you want. And they're like happy and carefree and the best things kind of come out yeah. or where, you know, this has happened to me. I don't want to jinx it, but you know, uh, I remember one lady <laughs> from overseas, she, she was like, I, I really want, you know, I'm in my early forties. I really want a partner. I've never been married. I want to have a kid. And I'm looking at this chart and I don't, I just, you know, I'm like, if I see it, I just say it. So I'm like, I'm not super strict. So I said, I, you have bigger fish to fry. I was like, you need to get another job. You need to, you need to move to another company. This is that the other. And I said to her, um, you know, you have to, it, it'll be in the legal field. It'll be in like a city center. Uh, it'll be in, in the springtime. And I said, I mean, I described her spouse. I did all of that. But I said yeah. the urge to tell her about this job was like burning me on the inside. So I did. And I said, and this doesn't happen often. This is why I'm bringing the example. Because she was not thinking about the job. She was thinking about her love life. Okay. So even Abraham Hicks says the path to the thing that you want is never on that path. It's on yeah. another subject. And I said, you know what? There's this new moon in March. Let's say it was like the 8th or something. I said, um, you should hear some news about work. Okay. So I hope it happens on that day. She gets this reading a week later, like nothing. And then she writes me back and she goes, um, okay, that's crazy. I did apply to something. I, I, and I said, she's creative. So I don't know what she would be doing in like a corporate field. She goes, you know, I do marketing, but I just, and I said, it should be with a, with a foreign entity. So she said, there's an American law firm in Europe. They called me for an interview. I went when you said on this day in March, something like 18th or whatever, she said, I thought, why would that happen in like a two day turnaround? It's off by a few days. It doesn't matter. I wasn't even looking for a new job. Right. Um, 
she goes, she emailed me that exact day. And she said, they called me for a second round interview on that day. And on the way home, I got out of the subway. They left a voicemail offering me the job. So I was like, that's amazing. But this is the part that gets even weirder a couple months later is she met, you know, a tall foreigner at her place of work. (laughs) So it came full circle that she did meet a lover. Yeah. But um, it didn't come through. I mean, I did do the love reading, but that's the thing. She was open. If she was anyone else or she was in a different state of mind who thought this lady is crazy and she's trying to distract me from finding a husband, but she went with it. She was open and you said curious. She thought, yeah. okay, I'll throw out some applications. It, it's t- and it, I think she'd like gone through a breakup and moved home and then needed more money. So it worked out. Like it solved all her yeah. problems because it's timing. I'm sure it happens to you. People well, yeah. come to you at a specific well, time and it's like the floodgates open for them. And it's like, I mean, kind of to your point, also what you said about being available for that information in that time and full circle to what we were talking about at the beginning that that individual showing up is a co-creator. So being available and mm, for me, it's like some degree in faith that there's cooperative components all around us, unseen and unseen, you know, available to us. Things just, like you said, spring up or you just are are looking one direction and something's offered to you from another direction. It's, um, It's that willingness, I think, to be not so demanding of like needing it to appear one way. And I'm, I'm not open to any other directions. I'm not, you know what I mean? Being, being so rigid, I think has something to, to be said for it too in there. Exactly. Like somebody comes to you for money remedy. I say, go, go walk your friend's yellow dog. If if you, they ask you to dog sit and they're like, I'm trying to have a baby and get married. Like you are on one, you know, and I'm just yeah. like, whatever it is, what it is. And then they'll go, their friend takes a work trip. They walk the dog at the dog park and some hunk is walking up to them, you know? So yeah, you, have you to, never know. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. It, it. That's another thing too, that, um, I think all astrologers to some extent do, but especially how well preserved it is in the Eastern tradition is omens, the study of omens. And I, I, you know, like animals, I I see a lot of, and I think make a lot of sense to me. So that's something that you work with. So if I told someone, you know, I think something to do with a white rabbit, I saw a girl in my neighborhood had like some giant, I think she called it like a California King. She's like, this is like a hard to get breed. It just, uh, it was like the day of the eclipse back in April. She said, it hopped up to me in this like park behind a ravine. It isn't shipped. It didn't, it, I don't know if someone owned it. I put up posters. I've called all the animal shelters and it started jumping. So I, I and, yeah, I went, I was petting. I've never pet a rabbit. I was like, I'm petting this rabbit. This is cool. I'm doing a reading the next day and I'm looking at this girl's chart and I said something about a white rabbit and it was a white rabbit. And I was like, yeah, I was like, anything about a white rabbit. Da, 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 da. And then she's like, yeah, like I met a guy after your reading and he was wearing a t-shirt with a white rabbit on it. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know, but I know, you know, you know, too, if something's for you or it's for someone else, but you kind of like yeah. store it in your cabinet. And when it's time to come out, you're just delivering the message to someone else. And whether they, I I mean, they open the envelope, that's great. If they don't, yeah. there's nothing you can do about it, but you did your part. That's it. Yeah, exactly. That's a great point. Um, I, I feel like I have I could talk to you for a thousand hours. Uh, I want to ask you, on behalf of our listeners, if someone is just sort of getting started with astrology or wants to dabble a little bit more from for themselves, do you have any suggestions as far as like something to focus on? Or uh, I don't want to say an easy way in because I think there's lots of lots of paths that can lead us to the same same place. But. What would you suggest for someone that's just kind of newer and wanting to get their feet wet a little bit? A prospective um, astrologer, like a student? Yeah. Okay. I would say look into something that would make you feel better. So whether it's your health, where you can find love, types of love, you know, uh, uh, something I get a lot of that really warms my heart, even from people in their 60s, is why am I here? What is my oh, purpose? Yeah. You know, that's kind of yeah. why I really got into it. I thought I would love to know the des- the idea of destiny or something like that for myself yeah. and others. Because if you're actually truly, genuinely interested in the question you're asking, I can promise you, in my humble opinion, from what little I know, you will get a good answer. Okay. If, again, yeah. if you're doing it for, for views, frivolousness, and don't get me wrong, some people make a lot of money doing it, even if they're not genuine. But if you do it, to fulfill something in you and then 
use it to help others, you will get a far better answer than you could have ever imagined. Um, so I would start there. But anything that you find fun, anything that you really enjoy. I mean, I like books, so I've always been into books, and I've been so lucky to manifest amazing like vintage books that are out of print some of them yeah. I sell some of them I keep you know um and people who will just tell me things manifest teachers uh you can go to seminars workshops whatever but the best thing to do is to learn to read your own chart first because you understand that's the reference point you will understand everything when you relate it to who you are and then to the people immediately around you and then you know take it worldwide look at countries you know look at weather patterns or something like that yeah. but make sure that you like it because that way you will you can't go wrong basically if you're interested in what you're asking that's great so start by kind of playing with your own chart is there a place that you recommend that's like trustworthy for looking at your own chart i really like astro.com by uh i think liz green and robert hand they're western astrologers but they're like so masterful <laughs> i really like their website astroseek is a good site those are like western charts astroseek has additional features that are really cool as well um and then if you look at like vedic charts if you just like google you know, uh, lots of software will come up and options will come up. Just bear in mind for divisional charts, it can spit out slightly different results depending on the types of software. But I mean, yeah. the age of information, we can find out anything at any point in time. If you're looking for books, you can't really go wrong with good introductory material. This stuff is so old that I feel like you don't need to buy the latest sort of thing, you know, right. unless, unless yeah. I write a book, then get it. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like um, Linda Goodman, I mentioned um, Liz Green. Oh, Liz Green's amazing because she's very like, you know, psychological about it, very young and things like that. And then uh, there's Eastern astrologers. Um, Joni Patree is such a person. She has an amazingly popular YouTube there's a lady named Lada Duncheva or Astro Lada. She's really popular on YouTube. She's a tropical oh, Vedic astrologer. Okay, there you go. Yeah, so she's a tropical she Vedic astrologer. She was taught by a man named Ernst Wilhelm. He's retired from meetings. He mostly focuses on um, research now. But there's there's a lot of debate in that. It's like how can you be both? But that's what I mean. Yeah. You can you can find you can find just a Vedic astrologer. You can find just a, you know the greatest like living Vedic astrologer today is known as a god of astrology, Doctor uh, K N Rao. And then there's Dr. K.S. Chirac. There's incredible people. You could just, uh, KRS channel is another one on YouTube for people learning Vedic astrology. So pick whatever resonates with you. I mean, like I fell into this um, yeah. and I never wanted to leave. So I stayed, but pick, you know, whatever. Do you want to do YouTube? Do you want to do books? Do you want to do seminars? Do you want to, my favorite thing to, that I've ever done is buy readings. So I, the people that I learn the most from uh, one person in particular, I go to every year and because I, I bought their courses, they've read my chart and there was a strong resonance between us. And I know you listened to my Patreon video. That was the one who said that I would succeed when for, I got a reading basically from five astrologers, four said I would fail. This person laughed. They were like, no, you're a winner. You're born to win. And I was like, <laughs> really? You know, and they, they explained it. And I was like, oh, wow, this person's so technical. They're so smart. And then another yeah. year passed and another year passed. And so now um, I just learn by doing, basically. That's just me personally. That's this great. is why I ask when someone gets a reading, what's your level of knowledge? So if you put advanced or you're a professional, I'll show you my tools of the trade. I'm an open book because we're all here to learn from each other. Yeah. Um, and I'll show you how to do it. And if you're new or intermediate, that's okay. I'll tell you enough that you can just do it yourself for like a good year. And then you don't need anyone. And no one can fool I you, so you know how to and do you it. You have such an amazing wealth of resources up both in your Patreon, which is is a paid subscription, but it's not very extensive. Uh, and you have free resources out there on your YouTube and your TikTok mm -hmm. and I mean Instagram that is there as well. So I'm going to link all those. So please find uh, Guru Grit, which is the lovely Monica. I didn't tell you this before. <laughs> So I apologize, but we have something here we call the spirit speed round. It's just four easy, simple questions that I ask every guest. Are you down to play? It's super easy. All about you. Let's have fun. Let's go for okay. it. Okay. Uh, the first question is, um, will you share one thing that really shocked you or was unexpected as you really stepped into your gifts as an astrologer and a reader? Yes. That 
so many people are born knowing something that they don't have a name for, and they think it's normal for everyone, only to realize far down the line it isn't. Does that make sense? Yeah, like totally. I would, I, I would that. dream things that would come true my whole life, and I thought it happened to everybody. <laughs> and then I when I got that. older and I read like the Eckhart Tolle and the Deepak Chopra and everything, Marianne Williamson, I was like mystical you know psychic I was like I'm not psychic I don't care about this stuff you know you can astral project I was like who cares yeah I thought everybody you know I just didn't think it was anything special (laughs) yeah and I still don't I love that (laughs) yeah I I agree with you and that's part of my origin story too is there's things that I did when I was young that I just didn't you don't ask you don't know what other people like what's normal you just assume like oh everyone sees this or everyone does this the fact that it's sensationalized puts me on guard so I'm like, why are you yeah. saying everybody can do this? Everybody can do this. Yeah. I've come to, you know, break the spell of illusion that some people are ahead. They're not, you know, we just. Well, it's one of my favorite things about you and your work too, and the way you present it is kind of demystifying or taking the fear-based mm, programming off of it and just saying like, no, this is available to everyone. This is not scary or bad or. Um, I digress. Okay. If if you got to spend a day in the spirit world, you got the full tour, you got to spend time with everyone that you've ever known who's crossed over. It's almost time to return to your life. And your guide tells you you have one hour left and you can spend it with anyone who's on the other side. Who do you choose and why? Mm, My paternal grandmother that I've never met. Mm. And I can only pick one, right? Okay, no, there's really no rules here. You can do okay, you okay. Uh, and her son, my my dear uncle, who crossed over recently, so I'm very close to him. But my paternal uh, paternal grandmother, God rest her, um, we're very. I can't explain. I've never met her, um, but I just feel really close to her. And anytime I get a reading done, this is my barometer for very good psychic. Is they bring her up. They she has like a script. Okay. And these are women from all over the world and they will, they will, and it's not even English and they will go, I don't know what she's saying, but it sounds like da, 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 da. they'll speak it. <laughs> they'll describe her passing. And then they'll say something really specific. They say, she holds you when you sleep. And they say, Aww. she's who you get your strength from. And the first psychic I ever went to in my life, I was a teenager, had the same first name as my late grandma. Wow. So I knew that was no joke. And I knew that that was, uh, she's very much with me all of the time and to further solidify that last year I was at my uh, aunt's and I was going through old like family records she was showing me stuff she passed away and was buried 20 years prior to what would then be my birthday my the exact day yeah that's crazy very very crazy so I've always wanted to meet her and um not even ask about her human life. I know it was a difficult life. I know it wasn't a happy, it was a very hard life. You know, she lived a very hard life. She was a woman in the fifties and the forties, but just, just say, Hey, I've always known you. Yeah. Like it's me and it's you. And I just want to hug her. Oh, what a beautiful connection. I love that. Um, Okay. Even though we have spiritual gifts, we have very human lives. What is one quirky thing about you that people might be surprised to learn? I think I think what's not quirky, what's normal about me. Right now. <laughs> That's how I feel about myself. <laughs> um, what's not quirky? I, I'm very just a quirky thing about you. That's one quirky thing. See, when you say quirk, I'm thinking like what's pretty much mundane because everything is kind of off. I'm really into academia. <laughs> I love learning. I love books and. Uh, yeah, just like normal earthly existence. I would love to, in my ideal reality, I would have both. I don't want to just have a spiritual life. I also want to have yeah. an earthly life, which is very hard for me to reconcile because I know I was made to be on a mountain and be in full solitude and hermit mode. So the embracing a physical existence took me a really long time and I'm still not fully there. But I think- um, Work in progress, right? It's slow progress. Yeah. Like very, very slow progress. I don't know if that's very quirky. It's like the opposite. See how lame? Even the I answer think a lot is of lame. people get surprised that some spiritual practitioners tend to be like naturally reclusive or very like internal processors or it reminds me of, um, you said you're a tarot buff too. I keep seeing like the hermit. I'm like, yeah, it's the hermit. That's the, yeah. <laughs> that's maybe your natural leaning, but you're so public. I do think people would be surprised to know because you, you're so 
skill that you know the talks mm-hmm. that you give and the way you give information oh. your readings i think it's well right usually it's like, like i'm very type a i'm very like corporate so when i'm in that world if they knew about this they'd be weirded out and then when when they find me through here and i tell you like oh i do this people are like why would you do this when you could do that and then it's the other <laughs> way around so i just think i'm meant to live like a split life and you can see yeah. that in the chart actually <laughs> and i remember I going that. to astrologers and, and vedic astrologers and they're saying you can't give up either it's just inherently who you are Both so are part of you. I that's love my that. quirk I'm, I'm two people I, love that. I think that resonates with a lot of um people who would identify as like spiritual i think a lot of us feel in two pools at the same time and i love that you just said that we can see that in the chart too so there you go uh, leave us with one pearl of wisdom what's one piece of advice you wish that you had had early on in your understanding of your gifts i would say understanding of the world in general nothing really matters that much and not in a bad way or a defeated yeah. sense i remember i was in a very bad way my first year of university and i had this amazing uh, professor from africa who was just full of wisdom but he was really hardcore he wasn't super sentimental and i'd taken some time off and when i came back he ran into me in, like the food hall and as i was walking away he went monica and i turned around and he just looked at me like he didn't know what was going on he just he could just tell he looked at me and he went it's never as bad as the person thinks it is, you know? And I was like, okay, but I was so young. I was like, what? And my aunt actually said that to me all my life. She said, nothing ever works out as badly as a man thinks it will. It always goes a little bit better. And that's one thing I I realized is life just has no meaning. It has the meaning you give it. You know, there's people who are poor that are so happy that it makes people jealous. And there's people who are wealthy, who are miserable. We can't make sense of them, but that's the meaning you've assigned to your life. I've decided I'm a joyful being. That is the meaning I give to my life, you know, and that's the most important thing. I think, I don't know if it's wise. I don't know if it's a nugget of any kind of gold, (laughs) but you know, wherever you find yourself in any situation, it will turn out depending on how you think about it. So I'll leave you with this, you know, the free will versus what's predestined and karmic, et cetera. When you realize that your attitude actually affects the outcome of anything, like if you have a phobia and you face it, it shrinks and runs away. It's different. When you're a coward, everything is scary to you, right? When you become aware, when you become self-aware, you're basically a warlock or a witch. That's all magic is. It's like the arousal of the thinking mind and the feeling mind. So um, you become an alchemist. I love that. That would have made my life so much easier if I knew that 25 years ago. If I just knew there's no bad days. There's only days you've decided are going to be bad. That's it. I think that's really powerful and wise. So, thank you. Well, thank you for chatting with us. Like I said, I feel like I could chat with you for a thousand hours. I appreciate you being here and sharing your wisdom and your light. Thank you. Likewise. I'm honored. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Well, what did you think? As promised, a beautiful soul who has so much light to share and such a depth of wisdom. I know she was saying one of her quirks is that she tends to be intellectual, a bit of a bookworm, a bit of a loner, but I think that's one of the things that makes her so steeped in all of this information that she has, just her love of learning and her wealth of wisdom. Um, If you are interested in getting a reading with Monica, she has an Etsy store and you can find her under Guru Grit there. I mentioned previously, you can find her on TikTok at Guru Grit. She's got tens of thousands of followers. She's kind of a sensation over there. Pretty incredible. Her Patreon is also a wealth of wisdom. It's a paid subscription, but it's not too expensive. Um, I don't want to quote it and misquote it, but check it out there. She goes by Guru Grit there as well. And that's just what she considers the place for learning. Monica has been so generous to share all of this information with us. And I love that she gave some tips and ideas about getting started, whether you are interested in potentially pursuing a path as a professional astrologer or you're just wanting to dig and delve and dive for yourself. Um, So she gave a lot of information about that, but I really think she gives so much great information, tidbits, nuggets, uh, food for thought on her platform. So be sure to check them out. Of course, I will have them listed in the show notes. I will tell you, um, I mentioned at the top of the show that I received a reading from Monica, which was incredible. Um, 
spoiler alert, I hope neither of my kids are listening to this episode, but I plan on uh, buying sessions for each of them as well. That's just how good I think that she is at what she does and the depth of information she gives and the way that she guides from such a open-hearted, loving perspective rather than being in that fear-based thinking. I, I love her philosophy, the way she shares her light and how she is so based in wisdom and steeped in her craft and based in the knowledge aspect of it. So you've got both sides working for you with Monica. Um, I am so curious to know what you learned from this conversation. So I would love it if you would email me, share it in the comments. Of course, if you're not already subscribed, I would love it if you would subscribe to the podcast because it helps you so you never miss an episode and it helps me because you'll never miss an episode. <laughs> if you're not already on my VIP insiders list, head on over to my website, joyfulmedium.com. It is the best way to qualify for free trainings, the free monthly community healing that I have. I do have a free training in October that I'm super excited about, which I'll put a notice into the episode about. And the way to stay apprised of everything and get replays of recordings is to be on my VIP insiders list. It's just as simple as signing up with your email. So you can do that at joyfulmedium.com right on the homepage. And I am so excited to continue to have these conversations. Let me know if there is a specific practitioner that you're wanting to hear from on the show or a specific topic that you're wanting to hear about. I'm always looking for new ways to help you and to shine a light and to offer um, trustworthy practitioners and uh, teachers and mentors. So if there's an area that you're curious about that you want us to dive into on the podcast or a specific um, person that you'd like to hear from, let me know. You can email admin at joyfulmedium.com. And until our next episode, please know that I am leaving you with light and love and of course, big hugs. Bye for now. Thank you.